What a blessing just to be here. Thank you, Pastor, for the privilege that's been mine for these three days and uh, enjoyed the men's advance, enjoyed the services this morning. Uh, what a blessing to see this here tonight. Love you, Pastor, and his family. Went to lunch with them today. Three little girls. I had four little girls. And uh, they're all married now. By the way, I want to praise God. I don't know that y'all saw the news, but that flight that was coming from England yesterday, I had eight of my kids and grandkids on that flight. And uh, the flight got two hours out of England, and they had a major problem with the landing gear, and it turned around, flew back to Heathrow Airport. They dumped all their fuel. They closed the airport, stopped all the other flights in and out, covered the runway with all the emergency fire trucks, and the pilots safely landed the plane on three out of five wheels. And uh, I'm just praising God. My kids and grandkids are back here in the States now and safe, and I'm just really, really thanking God for that. And uh, so, anyway, let me talk just a moment about the table. I'll take it down after the service tonight. So if you want anything, if you'll get it as quickly as possible, if we run out of stuff, which we're already out of several things uh, because of the way I traveled here, I only brought one suitcase and uh, uh, I was only able to bring one of a lot of things. If there's something that you want, we could send a box back here and have your things in it. You'd pay the prices on the table instead of what's in the catalog. Please take uh, as many of the catalogs as you could use. If you sign up for our monthly email newsletter, uh, we'll give you some teaching on the family, the home. And just for signing up, we'll give you this, this uh, booklet, this book that's the message that launched our entire ministry telling how to turn around rebellious teenagers. This is the message I'm giving tonight on the demonic-like nature of anger. The DVDs are me preaching. The graphics like you see come up on the screen, come up on the TV screen as you watch it. It is a part of the Anger series. Ten DVDs in the Anger series. A couple of other key messages are Anger, the Destroyer, and the High Cost of Anger. I give this one actually more than any other message when I travel around the country. Uh, this is also a key message in the anger series, freedom from the spirit of anger. We've had lots of testimonies about it. And I like to comment about it because this, this DVD, is this message is based on Luke 9, 50, 50, uh, uh, 56 and 57, where Jesus said, "Ye know not what manner of spirit you are, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, here's an interesting little tidbit for you right here. I've got a message also on why I use only the King James Version Bible. 
If I had not had a King James Version Bible, this message which has helped ten, thousands if not tens of thousands of people, this message would not exist. The text of this message is only found without question in your King James Version Bible. The words of Jesus in that passage disappear from the NIV, the ASV, the RSV, you name almost any other Bible and the words of Jesus disappear. And uh, that's, this, this has a re some really key thoughts. Your children are not going to use the King James Version in the next generation simply because you stand up and say, this is the Bible to use. You've got to explain to them why you use that Bible. That's what that message does. If you love messages about the creation, you would love this. I promise you, this is the most fabulous, mind-boggling DVD. It's entitled, How Big Is God? The best DVDs on the table are Picture Proverbs, this is a picture of my grandchildren at my house watching picture Proverbs. It is every verse in the book of Proverbs, a verse on the left-hand side of the screen, a picture that communicates the meaning of the verse on the right-hand side of the screen. It is narrated with beautiful music and sound effects. When you see the three Hebrew children going into the burning fiery furnace, you hear the fiery furnace burning. When you see the lion standing over the unnamed prophet, you hear the lion roar. What we recommend is that you watch the chapter now, some people, I've run into people who say, Brother Davis, I put on picture Proverbs and leave it running for hours every day in my house. You watch the chapter. By the way, some Christian schools start their day out. Several Christian schools start their day out watching chapter of picture Proverbs. Watch the chapter that matches the day of the month. Pause it at least once and say to the family, the children, whoever, why is that picture with that verse? If you don't know that Bible story, and there's over 600 different Bible stories, many Bible stories, such as the angel rebuking Israel at Bochim, or Micah's priest and idols being removed from the house that a lot of people are not even familiar with. Then the reference is there. You can leave it frozen on the screen. You turn and read that story until somebody can answer why that picture is with that story and if you're only interested in the audios and not the videos, we took almost every message on the table, plus 70, about 70 more messages, 182 really key messages, all in audio MP3, and put them on one disc, and that is available. And so if you're interested in any of that, we'll be glad to help you. A pastor friend told me about a missionary friend that his church supported. He noticed that the missionaries seemed to be gone from the field and back here in the United States quite a bit. And when he contacted the missionary supporting church, he found out that the missionary had recently been arrested here in the United States. He had been out to eat at a restaurant and publicly attacked his son with some cruel, angry words. Two ladies who were sitting two tables over moved to the other side of the restaurant. And about a minute later, one of the ladies came to the missionary's table and said to him, Sir, you must respect that child. The missionary asked her what she said, and again she said, I said, you must respect that child. With that, the missionary with an angry voice said, Get out of here. And three times he said, Get out of here. She left, went back to her seat. When the missionary and his family got up to leave, she approached him again and said, I'm calling the police. I'm reading now from the letter the missionary wrote. He said, I told her in a loud voice, it is not my job to respect my son, but to love him, which is not exactly right, but I don't have time to answer it. He said, go ahead and call the police and I will wait. When the police came and investigated, the officer informed the man that he had disturbed the peace and he arrested the preacher. When the case went to trial, the missionary pleaded guilty to a disorderly conduct charge, though he felt he wasn't guilty, but he wanted to put the whole issue behind him. The problem had consumed three months of his life, dealing with his lawyer, the district attorney, the court system, all of that. When the mission board, responsible for the man, found out what had happened, they asked the missionary to resign, but they left the decision to the sending church's pastor. The pastor graciously asked that they, be allowed, that they be allowed to put the missionary in counseling for six months and see if they could help him. I was traveling in a totally different part of the United States 
And a pastor friend told me this story. And as soon as he told me, my heart was grieved and saddened. And after a day of just not being able to get it out of my mind, I went up to the pastor the next night and I said, Pastor, it's totally up to you. But I'd be willing to give you a full set of my anger DVDs if you'd like to send them to this missionary brother. Maybe they could help him if he would watch them. The pastor looked at me and said, Brother Davis, I think that is a wonderful idea. I'd be delighted to call him and talk to him about that and then send him the DVDs as a gift. So I prayed and I prayed, and I'll share more of that story later. A godly wife and mother in our church in Illinois, that is their picture on the screen, came up to me a while back when I was at church and asked me a wise question. The question was preceded by an observation. She said, Pastor Davis, I've noticed that you often bring up the issue of anger when you preach. Could I ask you, what do you do when something bad happens that you had not planned for? What do you do with the initial feeling of anger? I believe the text that I'm going to share with you tonight gives the answer to her question. I want you to notice that Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 has four distinct steps downward that follow each other into a dungeon of defeat. Notice the numbers, and you'll see why in just a moment. But read this ver these two verses out loud with me off the screen, everybody. Would you please? Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Now, notice step number one, be ye angry. Step number two, Sin not. Step number three, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Step number four, neither give place to the devil. Now allow me in this introduction, <clears throat> excuse me, to alliterate those four steps in these two verses. You could call these four steps downward into anger bondage or anger addiction. Step number one, stirring. Step number two, sinning. Step number three, settling Step number four, signing over. In fact, read those four out loud with me, everybody. Would you please, all together, number one, stirring. Number two, Sing. number three, Sing. number four, Sing. wonderful. Thank you for joining in like that. Now notice that it says, be ye angry. It means, be ye angered. It is describing a stirring that happens inside your soul. The Greek verb tense is a present passive imperative. The passive tense means not that you're acting, but that you are being acted upon. What it is saying is that there are coming unexpected bad things that you have not planned for. Those things are going to stir in you the emotion of anger. This is not a sin. The stirring is God's flashing yellow caution signal warning you to slow down and decide to let the Holy Spirit lead your spirit so that you respond with patience, love, and kindness instead of sinning by getting angry. Now, if you do not heed the caution of the stirring and calm your heart, then you will indeed wind up sinning. Be ye angry. And the second phrase is, and sin not. You and I never have to engage in anger either by our words or our actions. Verse 29 right below this says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Why? Because that's where anger usually shows up first, usually with the words that we say. Guys, aren't you glad you're not married to her? <laughs> then verse 31 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. Now, let me stop right here and just comment very quickly. I had a pastor friend who said to me, Brother Davis, could you establish the definition that you gave in verse 26 with using the Greek? And I said, yes, I can. Because if the definition I gave is not correct, then you have a contradiction in your Bible between verse 26 and verse 31, because verse 31 says to get rid of all wrath and anger. Now some people go so quickly from stirring to sinning that it's almost like they skip the first step completely. Did you ever notice that? That is why we're told in Proverbs 14, 29, he that is slow to wrath 
is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit, he gets quick, angry quick, exalteth folly. Ten times in your Bible, it is seen as a godly thing to be slow to anger. If you slow down when the stirring comes, you'll be more likely to act instead of reacting with anger. Now steps number three and four warn of even greater danger. First we had the stirring and you can deal with that and go no further. Then we had the sinning. And if you're in the sinning, then you need to confess right away. If you don't and you're not careful, then you can move to the third step of settling where it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. When the sin of anger is not quickly confessed, then it turns into what Proverbs 21, 24 calls proud wrath that settles into your soul as you sleep and permeates your entire being. Now, when I was studying this, I got to this point and I asked myself a question. What else in the Bible did God say should not be left overnight? By the way, pastor, you can make a whole sermon out of this. The things that God said should not be left overnight. Deuteronomy 21 said that if a man had committed a capital offense and was, to put, was put to death by hanging on a tree, that his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day that thy land be not defiled. Now do you see the principle? That offense and that anger have to be buried or it will defile your life like a decaying body staying around. Bury the dead body of anger, or your bedroom will become a breeding ground for bitterness. Read that with me, please, everybody. Bury the dead body of anger, or your bedroom will become a breeding ground for bitterness, stirring, sinning, settling. And the fourth one is signing over, neither give place to the devil. It is saying, you sign over a room, a spot, an area of control of your life to the devil. You give him place or ground in your life. You say, well, I'd never intentionally do such a thing. Doesn't matter whether it's intentional or unintentional. If you sin by getting angry and then let it settle, then signing over is what you do automatically. That's the next step that you take downward. And remember, this is written to Christians, not just to lost people, primarily to Christians. Now, follow me carefully. My next thought, because it is really the message. If anger is an area where Satan gets control, then maybe we can understand this area better by understanding and comparing it to another area where Satan has very clear control. And a key area in the New Testament where Satan was seen to have control was in relation to unclean spirits. So what similarities or comparisons might we make between anger and unclean spirits. And now you know why I call this the demonic-like nature of anger. And the first comparison I noticed between anger and unclean spirits is there's an obvious shame that seems normal to the angry person but is shocking to those around him or her. In Mark 5 and Luke 8, Jesus was in the country of the Gadarenes. Excuse me, and when Jesus went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time and wear no clothes. Now, folks, that is shameful. Isaiah 47, 3 says that when nakedness is uncovered, shame is seen. Don't you wish somebody could explain that to Hollywood? <laughs> this man felt no shame when he should have felt shame. And angry people will often publicly display their anger and have no shame with it. A preacher friend told a story from his childhood. He said, there was a dog in our house. It needed to go to the bathroom, but it didn't know how to say, I need to go to the bathroom. So the dog went to the bathroom right in our house. My daddy got up, picked up the dog, took him outside, grabbed his hind legs, and bashed his head against the wall. Then he came back inside and ate a big bowl of ice cream like nothing had ever happened. 
A second way that anger can be compared to unclean spirits is for many, their anger problem began in their youth. In Mark 7, 25, we read about a mother whose daughter, quote, had an unclean spirit. Now, I'm not claiming to understand everything I'm giving you tonight. I'm just reading some Bible here, all right? Then in Luke 9, 42, for a father's only son, Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child. Several times now, I've had some parent come to me and say, what do I do with my child? It's like he's just mad at the world in general, always getting angry. If somebody bothers his toys or some food is put on the table he doesn't like, he will get screaming mad. I think for many children, anger is manifesting itself because of their sin nature. How many here tonight have a sin nature? Let me see your hands. <laughs> yeah, that's all of us. You know what that means? That means any, all of us have the capability of committing any sin at all and none of us should ever get cocky or proud like we could not and look down on somebody else, all right? But at some point, children have to be taught that they are responsible for their attitude and their actions. But then there's another thought here. Many children are angry because they have been provoked to wrath by their parents or by somebody else. Do you see what that father is doing? He is, he's violating scripture right there. The Bible is very, very plain in this area. It is not a belt that you use on a child. I've been in Canada, I've been in Ireland, both of those countries against the law to use corporal punishment in relation to a child. I've been in states in the United States now where it's against the law to use corporal punishment in relation to a child. Do you know why? Because so many people have done it an unbiblical, wrong way that the government is just coming in and saying, no, you can't do it. The Bible says very plainly, and I cover this more in the message on the three key elements of successful parenting, and I don't really have time to cover it now, but the Bible says that the whip is for the horse's back. The whip is not for your child's back. It is not a belt. It is not your hand. Your hand is an object of love. It is not a board. It is not a paddle. It is not the back of your hand. It is it's not any of those things. It is always, study it for yourself, don't take my word for it, it is a rod. It is a little thin limb off of a tree that will bring a little sting, but it won't hurt the child. In fact, what I suggest you do, and, and I go into this in the message on spanking on the table, but I suggest that you make a, a, an ordeal, a big deal, anytime you have to spank a child. Some people will spank a child all day long, every day. It's because they're not doing it the right way. Spank a child properly, properly it'll probably take you 30, 45 minutes. And... Um, and, and only a few seconds of that will actually be the application and use of the rod itself. There's so much more that is involved in relation to that. But if you will, <clears throat> part of the thing I suggest is that you send the child to get their own rod. Let them think about what is involved and let them bring in whatever rod they want to bring in off of the tree. Now, two times in the New Testament we are told, Provoke not your children to wrath. It, both of these times it is addressed to fathers or parents. Provoke not your children to wrath and provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. Now that is the only time that the word discourage is used in the entire New Testament. God is very concerned that children not get discouraged. The number one way godly committed parents lose their children's hearts is by expressing anger at the child. Then Satan is able to step in because the heart is gone and Satan is able to step in and win the child's heart. Again, on the message, the three key elements of successful parenting, I explain that all you have to do is break that negative command right there. And when you break that negative command, that is all it will take for you to produce a teenage rebel. A mother lost her temper, grabbed her little boy by the arm and said, Son, 
The devil's got a hold of you. The little boy looked up at his mama and said, Mama, you're right, you're right. <laughs> a missionary called me and said, he was actually on the foreign field calling him. He said, Dr. Davis, I got a big problem with anger and I need help. He said, I have lost my temper several times with my wife and my children. My wife told me recently that I really frightened her the last time I got angry. He said, I know where it's coming from. I just don't know how to handle it. He said, it goes back to when I was eight years old. My two older brothers wrapped me in duct tape, turned on the water in the bathtub, and threw me in. The drain was open when they did it, but I didn't know it was, and I really thought my brothers were going to drown me. He said, it really affected me and caused me to have problems ever since. What happened to him? He was provoked to wrath by his older brothers. Here's an article from 2011 that says, a new study shows that children can learn anger from parents at an early age, babies only a couple of weeks old can pick up on our bad behavior. I'll be honest with you, I think it would even be true of babies in the womb. They studied 67 high-risk mothers looking at interactions with their babies during feeding times. And he noted that mothers who showed disgust, spoke in a harsh tone, or handled their babies roughly had children who acted out later in kindergarten and first grade. The children who experienced a more negative environment as infants were the same ones showing greater explosive behaviors later on. Now, in the message Freedom from the Spirit of Anger, I really go into this verse and show why you must not use wrath. You must never use wrath when you are disciplining your children. Read this with me, would you please? It is a really key verse altogether. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Do you see the direct connection between wrath and vengeance and that the purpose of wrath is vengeance? So, when you discipline a child in anger, you are not truly correcting the child. You are carrying out vengeance on the child. That vengeance does not belong to you. You have crossed a line that you should not cross, and it will provoke your children to wrath. Nothing. Pro the, the verse that I gave a while ago, provoke not your children to wrath, provoke not your children to anger. And there are many things that could provoke to wrath or anger, but nothing provokes to wrath like wrath. Nothing provokes to anger like anger. And so you get angry with your child. When you do, your child gets angry back at you and you get more angry in order to stop their anger. And you look at their face and you think you stopped their anger, but you did not. All you did was cause them to internalize their anger and it explodes as bitterness about 15 years of age. I wish I could go back to when my, three, my four girls were little girls, I can still remember in my mind's eye seeing the look on their face the times that I got angry with them. And this whole ministry was born, not out of some successes we had, but out of our failures. My own anger caused my oldest daughter to become a rebel, and we had a really nightmare situation that we dealt with. And I fell on my face before God and said, God, I don't get it. Help me to understand it. And that's where all of these messages were birthed from, including that first one, changing the heart of a rebel. Now, I'm talking about vengeance here. Vengeance is not always simply a physical thing. Humiliation is another form of vengeance. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament of how Hanan, the king of Ammon, humiliated David's servants by cutting off their beards and also cutting off parts of their clothes that left their nakedness exposed. And before it was done, hundreds of thousands of men went to battle over that and tens of thousands died. Pastor Bowman, I've thought about it. I'm not sure there is ever a time when a Christian should humiliate any other person. We're not even supposed to rejoice when our enemy is humiliated 
Now that's pretty tough to do. A lady about my husband's relationship with our five-year-old boy. My husband and son don't play ball, talk, or anything else you'd expect a father and son to do. The only thing my husband does consistently is criticize, yell, and belittle. Notice that word, belittle. He'll call my son a baby. He'll say, you act like a girl. My husband, my son gets upset and my husband taunts or spanks him instead of comforting him. My son has recently begun saying he doesn't love his daddy, wishes he did not live in our house. And then she says, is this going to create any long-term effects on his self-esteem? And obviously it is. Try to never do anything to humiliate a child. And if somebody else tries to do it, do your best to stop them. Now, here's an interesting thought right here. Look at this. God can righteously get angry, righteously carry out vengeance. God can even righteously humiliate somebody. That's what he did. When he made King Nebuchadnezzar like a wild animal for seven years, I promise you, he humiliated the greatest Gentile king, the head of gold, greatest Gentile king in world history, Nebuchadnezzar, And I'm not sure whether God deliberately tries to humiliate somebody or if his punishment simply does that because Nebuchadnezzar was such a proud man declaring he had built that great city of Babylon and then God smote him and God was smiting his pride. But what happens when God humbles a proud man is that often he does humiliate him. So God can righteously get angry, righteously carry out vengeance, Righteously humiliate somebody, but you and I are not God. And we better leave anger, vengeance, and humiliation alone completely. A third way anger may be compared to unclean spirits is that an angry person may flip suddenly from being normal to displaying wrath. Luke 9, 39, Lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out. People are often shocked and dismayed to see an angry person display his anger. How many of you have ever been shocked to see somebody who just went from zero to 100 miles an hour just like that with their anger? And you were like, whoa, where did that come from? That's what happened in that restaurant with that lady in my opening story. She was shocked to see that man talking to his son like he was. In fact, part of the charge against the missionary was that he had used profanity in a public place, which he denied. But I know exactly the words he said, and I cannot say them publicly, and I can see how it could have been defined as profanity. Did you ever hear of the great missionary John Patton? His biography is phenomenal. I really recommend it as family reading. And the stories of his life are so interesting. Early in his, biog- uh, in his autobiography, he told about a schoolmaster he had when he was about 10 or 11 years of age. He said the teacher was in some respects kind and tenderhearted. He bought John Patton a new suit of clothes. He taught John Patton to pray. But he said all of my teacher's influence was marred by occasional burst of fierce and ungovernable ungovernable temper amounting to savagery. Once, after having flogged me unjustly on my return, only at my mother's entreaty, he ran at me, kicked me. I fled in pain and rushed home. And when his passion subsided, he came to my parents, apologized and pled with me return, to return, but all in vain. Nothing would induce me to resume my studies there. Undoubtedly at that time, I had a great thirst for education, a retentive memory which made lessons easy. And as there was no other school within my reach, it was at a great loss that my heart shrank from that teacher. He had a teacher who would flip and suddenly go from being normal to displaying great wrath. Now, I was talking about how anger can be compared to unclean spirits, and when I was discussing this with somebody, they said to me, are you saying that all angry people are demon-controlled or demon-oppressed or demon-possessed? No, I'm not, but many may be. 
And what the Bible does say is that the person who becomes angry gives Satan some type of control in his life. A fourth way that anger can be compared to unclean spirits is that loud screaming is common to both of them. Luke 4.33, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice. The Gadarene demoniac cried with a loud voice. A man who had an anger problem said this to me. He said, Brother Davis, I used to think that I was not getting my point across at all unless I was screaming. Did you ever see anybody like that? Angry people don't really communicate because they're not following what Ephesians commands when it says you have to speak the truth in love. Now, picture something with me right here. Imagine you're standing outside. It is a terrible storm. The wind is blowing, the lightning is crashing, and two of you are standing out in the middle of that trying to carry on a peaceful conversation. Can you do it? No, you cannot. You really cannot communicate because you are focused on trying to survive the storm. An angry person, your mate, your children, your workers, they don't hear you. You can scream louder, louder, louder. They are not going to hear you. They are focused on trying to survive the storm of your anger. Have you ever seen a child being screamed at by his parents? He locks down, braces. He's bracing for the wind, the lightning, the rain. He doesn't hear anything the angry person is saying. It goes right past him. He is simply trying to survive the storm. And by the way, as quick as he can get out of that house, he will because he's tired of living in the middle of a hurricane. The fifth way the angry person often damages himself is that the angry person often damages himself worse than anyone else. In Mark chapter 5 it says, And always, night and day, the Gadarene demoniac was in the mountains. He was in the tombs. He's running screaming, crying, cutting himself with stones. He is like a wild man. A pastor in Texas called me and he said, Brother Davis, I wanted to tell you that I apologized to my church last Sunday for my anger. And he said, a man came to me on Wednesday and showed me his bloody fist and told me that he had gotten angry and slammed his fist into some glass that broke and smashed his hand. Anger often damages the angry person worse than anybody else. A mother wrote this. She said, I need some advice. Please help. My 17-year-old son got so mad, he hit his head on his car windshield and broke it. Now, I don't know whether she's talking about the head or the windshield. I think she's talking about the windshield. She said, he wrecked my new car by driving in the desert over ruts and curves and brought it home on a tow truck. He asked me not to be stressed out, but how can I not be worried about him? He broke his windshield with his fist. Charles Spurgeon said, anger is temporary insanity. By the way, in the message, Freedom from the Spirit of Anger, I studied every word in the Bible that dealt with anger. Anger Angry, wrath, wrath, fury, furious, and indignation. You know what's interesting? 80% of the anger in the Bible is God's anger. The other 20% is all men. 100%. Every person specifically named in the Bible that I could find having a problem with anger was a man. I forget how many men, how many groups of men. I, I believe there are angry people in the Bible. I think Jezebel and Athaliah were both very angry people. I think there were others, but they are not specific. It doesn't say specifically that they were angry, but there were over 50 different men or groups of men, I believe it was, that had a problem with anger. And uh, I named those words anger, angry, wrath, wrath, fury, furious, and indignation. There is a word that is never used in relation to God, and that is mad. It is only used in relation to man because God never gets mad. He never does because uh, 
it is a form of insanity, so God never does that. Somebody else said, you have to think about this one. He who is always blowing a fuse is usually in the dark. I have a book titled, None of These Diseases, written years ago by a Christian medical doctor. He had a chapter in there entitled, It's Not What You Eat, It's What Eats You. He said, Big Bill Brandon was a likable fellow when he didn't go off the handle, but when one of his men at the plant messed up, Bill would get furious and throw at him the sharpest words in his unprintable vocabulary. But the abuse that he hurled at other pit fellows always seemed to boomerang and fly back on poor Bill and put him in bed. You couldn't help but feel sorry for Bill as he lay on his stomach in bed, his eyes big, red, desperate, pleading for help. He'd been studying an x-ray in several hospitals where he had spent a small fortune. His trouble was always brought on by his anger, which tightened the outlet of his stomach and caused intractable vomiting. The occurrences were so frequent and severe that Bill was having a hard time working enough to support his wife and eight children. I read another article telling what anger does to the body. It said, the emotion of anger causes the blood to rush from the stomach to the limbs and to the brain. It increases the heartbeat, strains the blood vessels, and even the healthiest of persons cannot stand that indefinitely. No one, unless under distress of terrible circumstances, would willingly shorten his own life. Everyone who frequently yields to anger may rest assured he is shortening his own life. A sixth comparison between anger and unclean spirits is anger sometimes causes the angry person to lose everything. Apparently the demoniac left behind a lot to go live in the graveyard. In Luke 8, after Jesus healed him, the man begged Jesus to let him go with Jesus, and Jesus said, return to thine own house. And that word house, problem in his home, where his family were, where his family was. Same Greek words used in this passage to refer to everybody in a house. Anger has cost many people their family, their friends, and their finances. And anger itself is a destroyer of relationships. And that is why I want everybody to look at that picture and read that screen with me out loud. Would you please all together? If you have a marriage problem and an anger problem, if you don't correct the anger problem, then you can't correct the marriage problem. Now, would you study that picture? It's very carefully chosen. Talk to me here. Do they have a marriage problem? Yes. yes. Does he have an anger problem? Yes. Pastor, can you help them with their marriage problem if you don't help him first with his anger problem? And the answer is no. It is impossible. You have to deal with this anger problem or you can't help them. Look at this one. Read this one with me, everybody, would you please? If you have... The parenting problem. Now look at that picture. It also was very carefully chosen. And my guess is that we have a rebellious teenager on our hands here. We also have an angry father. Can we help that girl if we don't first help that father? And that's why lots of people, they'll bring their rebellious teenager, they'll set the rebellious teenager down in front of the pastor or a professional counselor, and they'll say, fix my kid. But if you study Luke chapter 1, verse 17, that's backwards. Luke 1, 17 is very plain that you start with the parents first, then you go to the child. We, we had to, um, a mother call us several years ago. She was in Arizona. They had a rebellious teenager. Their insurance paid for them to put that rebellious teenager in a hospital. After their, ho after their insurance uh, limitation of $50,000 ran out, they kept her in the hospital. She wasn't any better. And they... They put their house up another 50000 They put their life savings up another 20000 And then they were broke. And they brought her out of the hospital. And she was worse than she was when she went in. While she was in the psychiatric ward of that hospital, she had met a practicing witch who taught her the evil things that she knew. 
And this mother, desperate, already spent $120,000, called us up, ordered our videos. She got all the videos she needed, which was several hundred dollars. She said, if I'd have found this earlier, we could have saved over $100,000. And they started doing what they needed to do. They were starting backwards. They were starting with the child instead of starting with the parent. Now, many parents over the years have sent sons or daughters away to institutions where the child was helped and came back home changed. But when he came back home to an angry father or mother who had not changed, then the child quickly reverted to his former rebellious self. A leader of a church told me how they lost their pastor. Somebody recommended a preacher from a neighboring state, and the man seemed to be a solid man with a good wife and children. He had nine children. He came and preached. And the church was considering calling him his pastor. But after several days, during one of the meetings with him, they were shocked. Remember how I said earlier, a person will flip and suddenly become angry? He flipped. They heard him get angry, lose his temper, speak harsh words. When he was approached about it later, he became defensive, and the church decided they better look elsewhere. And several months later, the man telling me the story said, he found out that the preacher and his wife were divorced. Nine children without a dad and mom in the home, and it really went back to that man's anger. A man with an anger problem gets himself in a situation where he wants to take action to help his children because many angry men love their children, but they get themselves in a situation where they cannot take the action they need to take. Now, we don't, we don't counsel everybody around the country. We tell them what DVDs to get, but anytime pastors call, we talk to them. And a while back, we counseled with the family of a pastor. The pastor had three daughters, ages 23, 18, and 11. And he had just found out that the 18-year-old was planning to go to a movie theater with a 23-year-old guy she had just met. Her dad had never met. Dad knew nothing about. Now, I know the world thinks nothing about that. If you're a committed Christian, that alarms you. He went to his daughter and said, Now, honey, you cannot go. She said, sorry, Dad, I'm going anyway. And he got angry and blew up at her. And his wife then got upset at him for getting angry at his daughter. Now, what had happened was he'd been angry so much over so long a period of time, he had caused his wife to become defensive of the children and the children defensive of their mama. Now, the marriage is damaged. His relationship with his children is damaged. And now that the daughter is 18, because of the anger, there is no heart string to keep the child in line. The most important thing in parenting children is to get their hearts, keep their hearts, be extremely vigilant to not lose your children's hearts. And if anything ever happens that you lose a child's heart, you do anything you have to do to get that child's heart back. Anything you have to do. And when I say anything, I do mean anything. Uh, we've told two families, we counsel all over the country all the time, we've told two families in the last month, and they listened to us, who had um, rebellious older children who were still living at home, and we told them, the best thing you can do is get out of the United States. You will probably not turn that child around. And I don't have time to explain that, but there are principles involved that that would really help them if they could get out of the country and one-on-one -on -one spend time with the child. Number seven, the angry person loses control of himself and becomes controlled by his anger. The demon-possessed people of the Bible were under the control of the demon. The demon would use the man's mouth to speak with. According to Mark chapter 5, the demon would give to that demoniac supernatural power to break the chains on him, he was under the control of the demon. How many times has an angry person been referred to as losing control of himself? A famous preacher from the 1700s referred to his impatience and anger as a, quote, ferocious wild beast that I have never been able to conquer. Now, anyone who will can stop the anger while it's still in the stirring stage. Once you yield to anger, you will no longer control it. It will control you. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, April 2008. 
A newlywed couple spent their wedding night in separate jail cells. She in her wedding gown, after police said that they brawled with each other and then with members of another wedding party at a hotel. The fight started Saturday night at the reception after he knocked her to the floor with a karate kick. This is real love on the honeymoon, folks. In the seventh floor hallway at a Holiday Inn, according to police. It escalated when she attacked two guests from another wedding party who came to her aid. The melee moved to an elevator and then to the lobby where the couple threw metal planters at the two guests of the other party causing minor injuries. And the police sergeant who reported it said it was pretty wild. Now here is a major difference between the anger of man and the anger of God. Watch this. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 11, God says that he is weary with holding in his fury. God can and does hold his anger, control his anger. God never flies off the handle. The Holy Spirit will give you control of getting angry. Once you get angry, you lose control. Some people hurt and kill. Everybody who gets angry sins. Anger in people is always a negative thing. Anger in God is never a negative thing. Now, every time I speak on anger, there are two things I'll, I have to deal with. I have to explain the verse about being angry and sin not, and then I have to answer the question, but didn't Jesus get angry? Well, the only time in the Gospels we're clearly told that Jesus used anger was in Mark chapter 3, verse 5. Maybe he was angry when he cleansed the temple. We are not told that he was. The Pharisees in this passage could see that Jesus was about to heal on the Sabbath day a man with a withered hand. It is interesting, the complete control Jesus had of his anger. He really did nothing with the anger at all. Nothing. It is simply stated that it was there. The verse says simply that Jesus looked round about on them with anger. That's all. Now the Greek word there is orge. It is used 36 times in the New Testament, but it is never used in relation to any other person in the Bible but Jesus himself. But that same Greek word is used in three different verses to tell you and me to pointedly not use anger at all. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and so on be put away from you. Colossians chapter 3 verse 8. I want to have you read this one with me. Would you read that all together please? But now ye also wrath, malice. Now, <clears throat> Um, I was speaking in Arkansas and I had given a message on anger and a man came up to me and he said, well, your problem is you didn't raise boys, you just raised girls. You got to use some anger with boys sometime. And he said, um, I, heard everything you got, I heard everything you got to say and I still think a little anger is all right. Okay, would you look at that verse? Uh how about a little blasphemy? Is a little blasphemy all right as well? Hello? How about a little bit of filthy communication? Is that all right? No, you've got to put all of that away. James 1.20, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now, I don't claim to fully understand what I just shared with you, but here is the simple truth. Jesus could handle anger, and you and I cannot, and we better just leave it alone. The eighth comparison between anger and unclean spirits is this. Many times the angry person does not see his problem, so he does not see the need for help. This is huge. Are y'all listening? The biggest problem we will have in this service tonight is this. Somebody who has a problem with anger, probably several somebodies, will not admit they have a problem with anger. And they'll destroy their marriage, they'll destroy their relationships, they'll destroy their children, they'll destroy their grandchildren, and they won't admit they have a problem with anger. Notice this. 
That Gadarene demoniac needed help. Others had tried to chain him to help him. He would not be helped. When Jesus came in Mark 5, 7, the unclean spirit cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of the Most High God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Leave me alone, Jesus. You're tormenting me by trying to help me. Unclean spirits are stubborn. And angry people are often very stubborn people who don't want help. It's amazing to me. You can... I was a pastor. And I had people come to me and say, Pastor Davis, doesn't that man know that he's got a problem with anger? And I say, he doesn't know it. Doesn't that lady know that she's got a problem with anger? Have you seen how she gets upset and screams at people? She'll get right in their face and scream at them. And I'll say, yeah, I know it. She won't admit she's got the problem. I can't help her. And the damage they can do in a church is unbelievable. In the high cost of anger, I talk about how there were times when I was a pastor, I would spend, somebody would get angry in a service or get angry at a, at, at a game or at an activity. It would take me two to three months to deal with that as a pastor. It would just reverberate on and on. And you could not, I want to tell you, preacher, if we can just get anger out of our churches. I mean, if you get out of the homes, that's the big deal. But if you get out of the home, then you get out of the church and you wouldn't believe what a difference it can make in your home and in your church. But I had people, I remember sitting down with somebody saying, look, you threw somebody up against the wall right here. You screamed at a child publicly right here. You manifested anger here and here, and here, and here. And they looked at me and said to me, I don't have a problem with anger. I'm just an intense person. Well, I'm sorry, there's no cure for intensity. There's nothing wrong with, an intens with intensity, but there is something wrong with indignation. Satan's deception in this area is so devastating, so powerful, and often it has saved people, but it's like they're living in the tombs with this deadness in their life from before they were saved. And the anger is so much a part of the fabric of their very soul. It is woven into their very being that nothing else even seems normal. Angry people will fight you to not leave the graveyard of their anger. And even if they do see the need to move out of the graveyard of their anger, they still like to go back and visit unless they're continually reminded that anger is a tomb of death, it is not a garden of life. Now, I'm not quite done with my message, but you, remember, but you remember the opening story? I'm talking about how the angry person doesn't see the problem, so he doesn't see his need for help. And this missionary had spent three months in this area, had finally pleaded guilty, and the mission board was ready to let him go, and the pastor was saying, let me counsel him. And I said to this pastor, I'll give you a set of anger DVDs if you would feel comfortable giving them to him. Now, the reason is this. We have found a solution to the anger problem. Lots of people, we hear about it all the time. If you're here tonight and you realize you've got an anger problem, here's what we recommend. Get the anger DVDs. And at least once a week, you've got to put it on the calendar. Maybe it's on Friday night. Maybe it's on Monday night. Whenever, put it on the calendar. Things not on the calendar. Don't get done. The whole family sits down and watches one of the anger DVDs every week. Ten DVDs, ten weeks. Then you start all over again. Ten more weeks. And what will happen is the water of the Word of God will wash the anger out of the family's life. Then you watch one DVD a month to keep the anger out. I'm thinking of stories I could tell you about how that has worked. And I just don't want to take the time tonight. But anyway, I'd said to this pastor, I'll give, him a, I'll give you a set if you want to send it to him. He said, I'd love to. He said, uh, it's a wonderful idea. When I was working on this message, I wrote that pastor and asked him how it worked. And he wrote me this back. He said, when I spoke with the missionary, he still denied having an anger problem. He said he's going back to the mission. By the way, if you know who this missionary is, please don't tell anybody his name. My purpose is not to embarrass or hurt anybody, all right? So if you know, please don't tell anybody. Um, 
he, he's going, he said he's going back to the mission field with or without his church's approval, with or without support. The pastor said, I really feel his attitude is not conducive to being taught. He said he did not need the DVDs. He denied the conversation that I was told took place where his wife agreed that he had an anger problem and that was why she and the children did not want to go back to the field with her husband, why they stayed in the United States so much because they're afraid of the husband's anger. His pastor feels like he needs to resign his mission board. He just did. I got the letter and work on his family before he goes back. But hold on, folks. Here's what's sad. There is no working on his family. If he won't work on his anger, there is nothing to be done. Can he solve his family problems? Not until he deals with his anger problems. Two more quick thoughts comparing anger and unclean spirits. Read it, please. A man cannot get and keep victory over anger unless he replaces the anger. Matthew 12 tells about the unclean spirit going out of a man. And then... He returns to the house where he came out, finds the house empty, swept, and garnished. All the garbage cleaned out, but nothing good put in its place. And he goes and takes seven other spirits worse than he is, and they enter in, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. You cannot simply say, anger be gone. You cannot simply say, Jesus, clean the anger out of my life and have victory. You must replace the anger. It's like the demon going out. You must consciously put things in its place. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger be put away from you. And what do you replace it with? Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. By the way, those two verses be great to put up on the wall of your home. Maybe every once in a while... You need to walk over and be reminded of this. Have we replaced this? I have a whole message on this subject on the table. When that stirring comes that I talked about, you have to think, this is God's signal to me to let God give me patience and kindness and gentleness. Proverbs 31 talks about the law of kindness. And maybe you need to put a sign up in your house and say only, only kindness is allowed here. I was in a church, honestly. I was in a church where right over the door before they walked into the auditorium, they had written kindness spoken here. Maybe you need to do that with your home as well. And now, let's review and I'll wind this up. You want to read my points with me all together, please? Number one. There's an obvious shame that seems normal to the angry person, but is shocking to those around them. Number two, for many. Number three, an angry person may flip suddenly from being normal to displaying wrath. Number four, loud screaming is common to them both. Number five, the angry person often damages himself worse than anyone else. Number six, Anger sometimes causes the angry person to lose everything. Number seven, the angry person loses control of himself and becomes controlled by his anger. Number eight, many times the angry person doesn't see his problem, so he doesn't see the need for help. Number nine, a man cannot get and keep victory over anger unless he replaces the anger. And I love number 10, read it. The forgiveness and deliverance of Jesus is the only true freedom for the angry person. He is the Lord Jesus, the Savior, the Deliverer. That place, that ground that you signed over to Satan, ask God in the name and through the power of Jesus' blood to take back that ground for himself. Go back to that time in your life when that stirring led to sinning. Then you settled in. Then you signed over and say, Jesus, in the name and through the power of your blood, I want to take that ground back. The demoniac departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. The world is amazed when angry people change. Here's what the world says. Manage that anger. God says, let me cleanse your life of that anger. If you're lost, trust Jesus 
as Savior. That is more important than anyone else. You need Him living inside of you or you can never get victory in any area of life like you need to get without Jesus Christ. I have one final, very short newspaper article. This is the man's actual picture. A Brazilian man, Enrique de Santos, 35 years old, decided he wanted to look like the superhero character, the Hulk, whose power is supposedly unleashed whenever he gets angry. So Enrique used a green paint to paint himself with, a green paint reserved for ballistic missiles and nuclear submarines. It started out as a little prank. He wanted to paint himself like the Hulk. Now... He is staying green permanently. The comic book fan tried to scrub the glossy green in the shower, but the substance stained his skin permanently. And the newspaper article says, embarrassingly, the superhero wannabe doesn't have the power to get the stuff off. <laughs> Anger will permanently stain your life but the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from any and all sin if you will let Him do it. Would you bow with me please?